So the next session will be kept by Dr. Anupendu Pali. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Christopher Lin. And in fact, we will continue with the proceedings and shift on to the second session for the day, which will be on political economy. Uh, we have two very distinguished uh, speakers, and if I could take the liberty of using the term heavyweight speakers for this session. Uh, my, my friends and colleagues, both of them, one, uh, Dr. Narayan, who will come in on South Asia energy options and policies, but before him, Dr. Christopher Len, a senior research fellow on external factors affecting South Asia's energy output. I uh, don't want to take too much of time introducing both of them. We have extensive uh, bilaterals. I would just like to mention that this is an extremely important session for the workshop that is being discussed today simply because the political economy context and the issues involved would uh, come in in a substantive way to impact all public policy factors. And after we have uh, the two speakers, we will be having a very distinguished discussion. Uh, discussing both the papers, Ms. Vandana Hari, who is the founder and chief executive officer of the Vandana Insights. So, Chris, 20 minutes. Hello, it's me again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been talking all morning. Uh, my presentation is on uh, energy factors affecting South Asia's energy outlook. And just to uh, give some context, I'm really flattered by the introduction by Dr. Pali. But to be honest, South Asia is quite new to me. And I thought that it would be useful for me to add value to this conversation by focusing on the concept of uh, energy transition at the uh, conceptual level. So we've been talking about energy transition this morning, but I thought that it would be useful to give some uh, sort of conceptual underpinning and also to talk about the factors affecting energy transition by looking at it, focusing on external factors. So my presentation is as follows. Okay, so very quickly on South Asia, Professor Castro has already given a very good introduction this morning, so it's just a very, very quick overview. And then we're going to talk about energy transition. We've been talking about energy transition all morning, but what does it actually mean, right? And then we're going to talk, focusing on the external factors affecting energy transitions. And then I'm going to talk very quickly about the implications for energy transitions for developing countries, right? So, uh, South Asia, uh, there's been uh, an introduction this morning, so I'm going into details. All I want to say that it's a very diverse region, socially, culturally, economically, politically, and even at the climate level. You know, you have the, the very tropical weather to up in the Himalayas where it can get very cold. Right, and um, it's one of the least integrated regions in the world that has been spoken about this morning. And I think one of the common challenges facing the entire region is the question of energy access. And you'll see that I put the <coughs> subtitle there, Universal versus Sustainable Energy Access. Because I think for developing countries, when we talk about energy access, we are talking about ensuring universal access. And that's quite different from ensuring sustainable access, right? And you know, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Gamisa mentioned the divide between the rural and the urban. So there are all these different distinctions uh, when we talk about energy transition, and it's very important to keep this in mind. And what really struck me when I was reading up on uh, South Asia is that, uh, according to a 2015 World Bank report, nearly 400 million people are still without access to electricity. So the emphasis now, I think, is about uh, universal access, although the narrative now is to drive towards sustainable universal access. Energy transition. Uh, there are different definitions going around, but I think a very simple one would be uh, defined as the shift from current energy production and consumption systems 
which rely primarily on non-renewable energy resources such as oil, natural gas and coal to a more efficient lower carbon energy mix. And then we need to keep in mind that there's no single mix that would be ideal worldwide. Although international climate summits seek to adopt global objectives, the energy transition is specific to each country or group of countries. And then we must also remember that uh, this process uh, is actually quite slow because energy systems have long life cycles. So energy systems, they're not very dynamic and the transition, to me, it's more like a gradual uh, process rather than uh, revolutionary uh, at a certain level. I, I think I can elaborate on that a bit more if you like later. And then when we talk about energy transitions, we are talking about technological breakthroughs and then also a change of uh, user habits, right? So um, I was looking at energy transition considerations and I came about, about this uh, concept by the World Energy Council. We talk about the energy trilemma concept. So basically, it's about balancing three seemingly conflicting yet interwoven objectives. So on the one hand, we talk about energy security, about the reliability of energy supply which uh, must be uh, ensured to meet current and future demand. And then you talk about energy equity. It's about energy being accessible around the world, particularly in emerging markets or developing countries, and then affordable pro uh, cost and across the uh, full spectrum of the population. And then you also have the factor on environmental sustainability, and that's where issues like global warming calls for improved energy efficiency and the development of renewable and uh, low greenhouse gas energy sources. Okay, so these three factors actually they tie in pretty well with the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal for 20, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, building on the Millennium Development Goals. And, uh, there are a total of uh, 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets. But I thought that these three actually fits in very nicely with the energy trilemma uh, uh, points which I mentioned. So within this uh, sustainable development goals, SD7 is talking about ensuring access to affordable, reliable and sustainable and modern energy for all. And then there's also the economic aspect about energy equity, promoting inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment and visa work for all. For that to happen, you must have good energy access for all of your population. And then when we talk about environmental sustainability, it's quite similar to SDG 13, which is about taking urgent action to combat climate change and to address its uh, impacts. So now, I'm going to switch gear a little and talk about the external factors. It's not working again. Okay, external, external factors affecting energy transition. So I think the discussion this morning has focused a lot about the different approaches and uh, policies of uh, respective governments and what government can do, but we must also remember that the governments are constrained by different factors which are outside their control. So I've listed a number of external factors and uh, I've sort of itemized six. It's not comprehensive, but I thought these are the key issues that sort of come up which may have an impact on the energy transition uh, uh, process for individual countries. So I'll go through them one by one. Um, there's not enough time to elaborate on every point, but I think most of you recognize them. Uh, first, with regards to the international agenda on climate change, there's the Paris Agreement and that's how come to shape our narrative about the energy transition and the importance of a low carbon economy. And within that, you know, there's a mainstreaming of uh, 
adaptation policies into development planning. And then you have other global agreements on emissions. One example is the IMO uh, limit on uh, uh, sulfur content of fuel and also on nitro nitrogen oxides for ship exhaust. And then of course the other factor is you know, you have people who are into climate change denial. Uh, so these are the factors that will sort of affect uh, how a country addresses uh, its uh, uh, energy transition. Okay, the other factor, my background is in international relations. So this is actually the slide I'm most familiar with. And it is the role of uh, international politics, the politics of energy, and of course, uh, how the markets work. So, uh, you know, uh, there are certain regions which we pay particular attention to because that's where most of the oil and gas are from. So, you know, you have issues, uh, you have regions like the Middle East that uh, can affect uh, the energy transition uh, uh, process or speed. Uh, availability of uh, oil and gas uh, from the region uh, may spur countries to think about alternatives uh, from diversification of routes to diversification of fuel types. Right? Then you have China's Belt and Road Initiative. They have a lot of, uh, they have a grand vision of connectivity and they are prepared to invest in various kind of uh, systems and infrastructure. So that will also kind of shape how a, country, uh, a country's uh, uh, developmental path. And then the other one, I saw, the other points I saw, classify them all under excess and supply of oil and gas. So, like I mentioned earlier, the security of supply chain, if you talk about oil and gas, there will be concerns whether individual countries have steady and good access to the supply, you know, be it from uh, access through pipelines or through the maritime route. And then you have issues like oil and international sanctions, for example, uh, sanctions against Iran or international sanctions against Russia that affects their ability to uh, develop oil fields. And then you have issues like uh, resource conflicts, for example, in the South China Sea, it's not a defining feature, but the there is an interest or the belief that the region holds abundant oil and gas resources and there's competition uh, uh, in the region to ensure that uh, they can benefit from the resources they believe that are in the sea. And then you have issues like resource nationalism and the nationalization of assets. So that's another risk. And then you have issues like oil and gas prices and supplies, for example, with the rise and uh, increase of uh, unconventional gas and also unconventional oil, oil from the US that sort of shaped the energy market as well. And then people are talking about uh, developing the Arctic. So this will affect the supply of uh, fossil fuels available in the market and of course that will also affect price. Right? And uh, another point is uh, there are considerations about proximity to markets. If you have oil and gas, uh, if it's stranded, it's no use, but if you have a very big pool, uh, a lot of resources or reserves very close to your market, you have an incentive to tap into it. And then the other next point is on innovation in science and technology. Uh, I only know 20%. My friend there, Dr. Per Crystal Ru, knows 101%, uh, so if there are questions, we can ask him. What I've, what I've done here is to just sort of quickly itemize the various uh, uh, technological developments that are ongoing. And my point here is that there's no single technology that is going to be sufficient to provide a solution for all. But when we talk about the decarbonization of electricity supply, there are all this technological research and development that's ongoing. Uh, just now, uh, Mr. Acharya spoke about energy storage being a game changer. Yes, it will be. Uh, that's one, one aspect. And technology can really change and alter the so-called uh, uh, the energy landscape of the world. 
one very simple example is the role of unconventional gas in America. I mean, that has really sort of shaped the, 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 the uh, oil and gas markets. And then you have, like, there are short-term issues, uh, short-term R&D, and also, of course, long-term ones, you know, we talk about nuclear fusion, it's like a long time away, but some people say it's like the holy grail. And then you have uh, issues like energy systems integration, that's been ongoing, but the question is uh, how much improvement can we get from all this uh, technology that are in different stages of development, right? And then, besides the decarbonization of electricity supply, Another aspect when we are talking about technology is in terms of the major gains in energy efficiency and savings. So there's a lot of research and development into the smart energy grid, smart metering, uh, issues related to insulation and then efficient heating, cooling and energy generation in buildings. And then also uh, when I was at the Singapore International Energy Week this year, there was a lot, a lot of talk about the digitization of energy systems where you get a lot of real-time information from the internet and then you talk about remote control of energy systems in very far away locations. So that will sort of change how the energy systems are designed and how it will be uh, applied uh, in different contexts. And then finally, again, on the issue of technology and innovation, we talk about the decarbonization of the transport sector. So we are talking about design improvements. It's not directly energy, but for example, using lighter materials, uh, looking for alternative fuels, and then renewable energy technologies integrated into these uh, 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 transportation systems. And then the next point, yeah, is uh, governance models. Uh, Things that are happening in other countries can also shape how you look at your own challenges and opportunities. For example, in Germany, there's this trend, the energy wind, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. They are undergoing their low carbon transition, they are trying to phase out nuclear. So the world is watching very carefully to see how this uh, what are the lessons that can be learned from this and whether this experience can be replicated. And then there are also discussions uh, on business models, regulatory innovation, investment frameworks. So, you know, public-private partnership is not a foreign uh, concept and this is something that uh, is very much in discussions all over the world. And then there's also the discussions about subsidies and the liberalization of markets and then also investment frameworks for cross-border uh, cooperation. So how do we protect foreign investments? So all these are happening at the international level, but when they actually apply, they are applied at the local level. And then you also have issues or uh, movements uh, where you, know, uh, you have green movements that are anti-nuclear or anti-unconventional gas, anti-fracking, and then uh, there are people who want to protect the Arctic, they don't think that the region should be opened up for resource exploitations. And then you have discussions on global energy governance, for example, in the UN context under the Sustainable Development Goal number 7. So all these are the soft issues that are being discussed. So beyond the hard technical issues, there are all these debates that are going on and that will shape how we look at solving uh, countries uh, solving problems at the country level. And then, <coughs> next, uh, access to international finance. Uh, again, uh, you need to have buy from financial institutions if you want to move the low carbon way. So you need to be able to get venture capitalists, insurance companies, banks, advisory firms to be on your side to help you uh, when you want to invest in these systems. And then, uh, in terms of investment trends, we can see that uh, there's more and more uh, sources for uh, 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 more and more capital moving towards low carbon funding. And then, you know, I just read uh, maybe a week or two ago, Step Oil is going to invest from fossil fuel company shares. And then also the question of when we talk about uh, so-called investments, are they actually developmental aid? 
or are we expecting high rates of investment returns when we sort of invest in these uh, energy systems? And then finally, uh, international intellectual property rights, the UNFCCC has already mentioned the importance of transfer of clean energy technology uh, as among the measures that can control, reduce and prevent greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the details, but I think that technology transfer is one of those issues that come up uh, in, when, when developing countries talk about implementing new systems. But what I want to focus a bit more on, um, which is related to intellectual property rights, is the role of the government as a public goods provider. So, the we need to sort of examine the role of the government in funding and in coordinating basic and high-risk research and development. So basic research we know quite a lot about, but I have one example here. United States Department of Energy, they have this program called ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. So they fund high potential, high impact energy technologies that are too early for private sector investment. And what is sort of appealing uh, in, this, uh, in this case is that uh, in almost all cases, the recipients may elect to retain the title to the in inventions. So basically the government is sort of subsidizing uh, these companies who may not otherwise receive any sort of funding to help them with their innovation process. Right, so final thoughts, I read an article Okay, uh, read an article uh, written by a Goldman Sachs uh, financier and he made a very good point, which is a very simple point, you know, because of the scale of capital required and the long-term nature of assets, there's a need for consistent policy over long periods for confidence to invest, right? And then, uh, what we are seeing now with the energy transition that's uh, uh, taking place is that the global energy market is in transformation and he argues that clean energy is, should be seen as a very sort of viable uh, emerging market. And um, as we know, the uh, challenge we are facing today is uh, the increase in energy usage while driving CO2 emissions down to stay within 2 degrees. So I was trying to think, okay, how can I put all this back in the context of South Asia and developing countries? So I thought, you know, developing countries, they already have a certain standard of living and the challenge uh, to them is to focus on energy efficiency drive while making sure that they can maintain that standard of living. Uh, whereas, I think for developing countries, I think that's where the real so-called challenge or the battle will take place. Where you have growing consumption, but you need to make sure that energy usage does not grow as much and then in that context, you need to really invest in energy efficiency and in low carbon energy systems. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for that uh, elaborate and articulated uh, presentation. Dr. Narayan, please. Thank you, everything. Uh, I take off from uh, Chris's uh, comfortable larger, I would say, uh, policy and political issues internationally. I'd like to spend a little time on, on, on South Asia and the kind of policy options that South Asia is currently having and exercising to look after its energy future. If you look at certain common features, and just look at the three larger economies in South Asia, that is Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. And uh, the commonalities in these three economies, very interestingly, all of them are growing at about 5 to 6 percent, or more than 6 percent. In India, they say 7 percent, Bangladesh, 6 percent, pretty stably for several decades now. And Pakistan is also doing 5% and above. So the energy demand in all these countries by even moderate expectations 
the demand growth for the next decade or so is going to be more than 8% or so per year. So where is the energy going to come from which will fuel this growth? And then you look at the kind of dependencies that uh, this region is having. And the dependencies are enormous. This entire region for fuel sources is entirely import dependent. For example, India imports over 80% of its resources. In, uh, in, in Pakistan and, and in Bangladesh, the gas and oil based generation is coming to closely close to about 70 to 90 percent now currently. India is also importing substantial quantities of coal and so is Pakistan. The total gas reserves in Bangladesh are only about 16 TCF, which, is, which will run out in about 10 15 years of time. So it is going to be an, an enormously import dependent <coughs> fuel based South Asia for the next decade or more than two decades. If we granulate, today Bangladesh has a power generation capacity currently which is even higher than Pakistan. Bangladesh has 13.5 gigawatts of capacity. Pakistan currently has about 11.5. But this capacity, as I said, will be growing at about 8% per year. Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan has current shortage of close to 5,000 megawatts. And the policy options that these countries are currently adopting all three countries are a bit different. Pakistan is now heavily reliant on Chinese investments to put up power plants based on coal as well as renewable energy plants. In fact, Pakistan just now commissioned the Saliwal plant, which is a 1320 megawatt plant. And that was commissioned within a period of just two years which is a fair bit of a record for a coal-based power generation plant. I think the international averages run from 3.5, 3.6 years plus, but this was done very, very rapidly. And two more plants are under construction. Renewable energies and hydro, a lot of Chinese firms have bid for Pakistan contracts. So in the next four or five years, Chinese presence in creating energy infrastructure in Pakistan is going to be quite significant. What this would result in is that dependence on coal in Pakistan is going to increase substantially. And currently, Pakistan generation is about 10% on coal. By 2030, it will be 30% on coal. And on a larger base, from about 11.5 gigawatts generation, you're looking at going to about 40 gigawatts generation. So 30% of 40 gigawatts will come out of coal. If you look at Bangladesh, the picture is, is, is similar. The current generation is just about 2% on coal. And that is out of this 13.15 gigawatts. And this is likely to go up to close to 30 gigawatt by 2030. And 22% of it will come from coal. So these are two large economies where you are seeing dependence on coal likely to increase in the next decade. And I would say primarily due to the, the rapid increase of coal-based plants, in the case of Pakistan, due to Chinese investments that are going there. In India, the picture is a little bit different. The current uh, dependence on coal is about 70% of the total generation, total generation capacity 300 gigawatts. 300 gigawatts includes about 
I would say 20 to 30 gigawatts of renewables, including wind and solar. But India has been aggressively pushing its role in the climate change uh, convention. And uh, by all uh, expectations, coal use in power generation would come down to 50% by 2030-2035 itself. And there are two reasons for this. One is, of course, the political policy. The other is a kind of, I would say, a little bit of a historical advantage that 300 gigawatts of plant also have about 52 gigawatts of incomplete coal-based plant. So there is no new start of coal-based plants that is envisaged for the next five or six years or so. So no new startups. And if these 50 megawatts come into production, then you would have a capacity which is adequate to meet this 8% demand growth for the next uh, decade or so. So a bit of plateauing happens there, by which time the renewables uh, then uh, take over. So the dependence, the fuel dependency of these three economies I think it's, it's, it's uh, important to look at uh, the fuel dependencies of these economies and see how this is going to be politically uh, managed. Because we must recognize that per capita consumption in these three economies actually is about the same, just about 300 to 350 kilowatts. I think a band between one and the other, about 300 to 350 kilowatts uh, per person, which is one third of the global average. So, given that this, this region is growing stably and the demand is growing stably, this will double by the next uh, 8 to 10 years or so. And therefore, how is the fuel dependence going to be, going to be managed is going to be a very, very large question. And if you are looking at fuel dependence, one approach that India seems to be adopting is an approach which would restrict the use of fossil fuels, primarily oil, to transportation. Which means that oil would be entirely used only for, say, vehicles, for cars, for two wheelers, for aircraft, for ships and even railways on a declining level at the railways because more and more would be electrified. And try to wean away fossil fuels from being used for power generation either through diesel generating sets or any other method. Again, you can see the difference between here and, and, and Pakistan and Bangladesh where the dependence on fossil fuels for electricity generation would continue to remain substantially high in the next 10-15 years. So while import dependence would not decrease, the level of import dependence, the growth of import dependence would, would stabilize in terms of India. And India is also starting to have the additional advantage of being able to refine and resell petroleum products because it has some of the largest refineries in the world now and new refineries are getting added, which helps it to balance its trade in terms of oil and oil products. Which advantage, again, Pakistan and Bangladesh are not planning to go towards because they are putting up refineries. So their dependence on, uh, you, you know, just, just to give an idea, 60% of Pakistan's foreign exchange expenditure is on oil import today. It's substantial. And unless you have some kind of a balancing factor, this should have a, 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 an implication for balance of payments that country.
if you move away, so this this is this is one approach that India seems to be adopting. Focus transportation fuels only on oil-based. Uh, and today, if you're looking at transportation fuels, today we have 95 million two-wheelers on the roads and about 24 to 25 million four-wheelers on the road, light and heavy. And this is going up almost at the rate at which the economy is growing, 8 to 10% a year. So this itself is a substantial growth to cater for in the future. So focus on that. Improve energy efficiencies. I think some of the measures were already talked about. Moving from uh, incandescent bulbs to LED, already showing a substantial saving. Moving to LPG, uh, which is definitely in terms of energy use, it's much more efficient than using a uh, firewood. And also removing subsidies for kerosene, for diesel, so that the cost of the final use is not hidden, but actually goes into the product. These are certain changes that we have seen that is happening in India. And then we step back and say, okay, if this is going to happen, what is the expectation of the international oil prices for the next five to 10 years? And we have seen a spike in oil prices uh, happen since about June, July. And this is, uh, substantially political, but India, remember, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh are recipients of the end price. So the politics of this increase has also to be taken into note. Obviously, the, the, the OPEC and the Saudi reduction, 20% reduction by the OPEC countries has had an impact. Much more subtle, I mean, I, I, I mean which, which is obvious to everybody and, uh, but, uh, needs to be mentioned is that uh, the Saudi Aramco is, is probably going to list in the, in the exchange and the valuation that they are expecting is, is close to about two trillion dollars. This would be the largest issue that would ever happen. And for a two trillion dollars valuation, you cannot get a two trillion dollar valuation on a forty dollar, fifty dollar price of barrel. So it is very, very important that the buyer, because as long as the oil is under the ground, the valuation is only a discounted cash flow. So if the valuation is a discounted cash flow, 40 to 50 thousand dollars will get the 1.5 trillion dollars, which is not the kind of a price that they would be willing to part that asset with. So for a two trillion dollar valuation, the cost of oil needs to be around 60 dollars. And then whether they give it to the public as an equity share or they give it to the Chinese as a 20% share is a kind of a, a purely becomes a money or an economic bargain. That is one of the major reasons why in the last two or three months you have seen this spiking of this oil price. And there's also the advantage that at $60, tracking becomes so much more uh, uh, economical. And you see the last two, three months, the huge bump in, in the new, in the, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the fracking fields in the U.S. which have come back into production and now U.S. is actually exporting for the first time it's exporting oil there. Why am I mentioning all this? Because all this has a bearing on what India, Pakistan, Bangladesh should pay for the oil. And one does feel that perhaps the days of hundred dollars are may not come back, but perhaps the days of 40 to 50 dollars are also gone. So we must plan for a 60 to 70 dollar expenditure per barrel of oil for the next decade to come. I think uh, this looks obvious and this, this puts a cost on the economy which is a cost in terms of foreign exchange. 
Finally, coming to coal, coal prices are also going up from about 40 to 50 dollars about a year and a half ago, they are close to 60 to 70 dollars now. Luckily, the coal-based power stations are currently operating at 60 to 70 percent plant load factor. So there is enough cushion for, for the next two or three years to make sure that the coal imports are, 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 are more under control. But I think Pakistan and Bangladesh would start facing a higher cost of coal as they go forward. And again, this would kind of become a, a, a political issue uh, as far as these two countries are concerned. So, to sum it up, costs of energy generation in these three countries through conventional fuels like oil and coal are not going to come down. And the extent to which these prices rise will contribute to internal inflation. The choices India is making is to move away from conventional fuels, much more into renewables, much more into energy efficiency op uh, options, and much more significantly into efficiency in transmission and trans transmission grids, which is reducing costs of peak load availability because transmission sector has improved considerably. For example, several state governments which are cash starved today do not like to enter into long-term power purchase agreements on flat rates of 4 rupees or 5 rupees because they feel it is more expedient to buy on the energy exchange prices on a short-term basis, which may be one week or two week basis or one day, overnight basis, which are at a fraction of the value because there is surplus capacity sloshing around currently. This will balance itself out as growth grows. So this is how, in a way, say, so therefore, there is now an incentive to improve transmission, incentive to reduce transmission losses because this reduces the cost of uh, overnight energy. Going forward, the issue of rural electrification, I see it slightly in a different context. Power availability in a, in a village hut, I would like to break it up into two or three uh, energy availability, I would like to break it up into two or three boxes. One is cooking needs and there it makes a lot of sense to move into an energy efficient fuel like LPG and that the government is trying to push through this Ujwal scheme and all that to push it, push it so that there is at the <coughs> lowest level availability of LPG, affordability compared to free, free firewood is, is, a, is a different question, but definitely availability. Second, transportation needs are increasing because the service sector of the economy is growing so rapidly and faster that people are moving more from place to place in terms of work as well as their daily needs. Now, transportation needs, by which I mean public transport as well as much more two-wheeler transport, tractors, farm equipment. And availability of these at market prices rather than subsidized prices becomes an important aspect of energy policy. That leaves the domestic electricity supply, I don't even mean the supply to schools and hospitals, but to individual huts, which I would call that just a lighting need, 
and maybe a fan need which becomes a which becomes in this economy a consumption need rather than an economic accretion if that is so then the energy policy of supply of energy to rural areas needs to be granulated much much more further into providing cooking needs separately into providing uh, uh, transportation needs separately into providing social welfare needs like schools hospitals separately and finally coming down to lighting the house which can even be done by a single standing uh, solar uh, panel this is a thought i'd like to i'd like to share this forum the politics of the finally the politics of 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 energy in india are also constrained by the fact that this the electricity grids are run by the states and the states have also got a right to charge a tax rate on 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 diesel and petrol supplied in their states which is slightly different from the gst rates which imbalances the cost for the business for the industry from state to state and these all these needs to be tackled i mean again this is this is a, a gst council a political council which is looking at it but it needs to be tackled uh, in a, at, a, at a political level so what is my my final conclusion my final conclusion is i do think that certain of the energy policies in india are moving in the right direction but i do think that the dependence on energy pricing international energy pricing will continue to be significant for all these three countries and growth would be accelerated or constrained by the way in which energy international energy prices increase thank you it was really really insightful dr narayan thank you for that uh, excellent presentation and may i now turn to ms pandit hari to discuss the points thank you thank you amitendu and good afternoon everybody i look at the oil market so i'm going to have a heavy oil bias uh, to my comments. Uh, a lot of what I wanted to talk about, uh, I have already touched upon, so that's, that's a good starting point. Um, let me just try and sum up from an oil consumption perspective, what are the issues for India? Uh, India is the third largest oil consumer in the world after US and China uh, its consumption is now a little over 4 million barrels per day a few years ago it surpassed Japan now Japan as uh, we know has a declining population growth rate pretty much the polar opposite demographics of, of India so not surprisingly each of Japanese oil demand uh, slipped into a secular decline a few years ago and India's is going in exactly the opposite direction. Some interesting numbers, right? Without getting too much wrapped up in, in data. It is the third largest oil consumer. It is one of the lowest per capita oil consumers, as Mr. Narayan has already mentioned. Obviously, when you take that 4.2 uh, million barrels per day, and uh, you take the 1.3 billion population, it's easy to see why the per capita consumption is low. Why it is important to keep this in mind is that when you hear people saying that as a result, for the foreseeable future, next 10, 20 years, India's oil demand has only one way to go, it's easy to understand. Um, I think this whole discussion about EVs and Modi's recent uh, proclamation of his target to have all new vehicles sold in India to be electric vehicles from 2030 and 
that's a separate discussion about how realistic that is. But um, that has put a question mark on that. Is that incline going to be like this? Or if it's, or well, we all know as the lessons from the developed world is that after a point it plateaus. So will that plateau be sooner uh, for India? I think that's probably a, a separate discussion we can uh, touch upon it a little bit. When um, global oil prices began sliding in 2014, and what a dramatic fall it was, right? From more than $110 a barrel, they came crashing down, and at one point, they had come down below $30 a barrel, uh, with some people also suggesting that the next target was 20. Uh, didn't happen. Uh, thankfully, for a lot of oil uh, <coughs> producing countries and companies. Um, it, this crash in oil prices produced winners and losers all over the world, and you might have seen some of those reports. Let's look at what happened in India. As on a net basis, you have a country with strong population growth, strong economic growth, strong, strong oil demand growth, also a strong growth in import pointed out, more than 80% of oil needs uh, of the country have to be imported, crude needs to be specified. So on a net basis, you would say, obviously, I mean, India is a winner, is amongst the clear winners. But if you go down a few levels from that, and you might have read some of the reports recently, it was a big uh, issue taken up by the media, especially, is that Consumers were complaining. They saw when they went to pump petrol or diesel in their vehicles, they were complaining. They said, we see oil prices at $60 a barrel on the international markets. And mind you, consumers are very, very aware nowadays. You know, the days are, are gone when uh, the man in the street didn't know where Brent and WTI are trading. So it's $60 a barrel. How come I'm paying the same in rupees per liter at the pump that I was paying back in 2014. What happened here was that as the prices started declining, and of course the government removed, got, got rid of subsidies, that was a relatively easy thing to do because as the benchmark crude prices were declining, obviously there came a point pretty much towards the end of 2014 where they matched the subsidized prices. So effectively, you know, it was almost like saying effectively there are no more fuel subsidies, but formally and officially the government did away with subsidies. But it did something else uh, along with that. The government said, we want to also benefit in this decline in prices. So they started uh, ratcheting up the taxes. So as a result, now you, the reason you consumers in India still see pump prices at the same level as when crude was more than $100 a barrel is simply that the tax proportion of the price of the pump has gone up. So within India, so net India is, uh, is a winner, but within India, I think the government has been a far bigger winner, relatively speaking. Um, let's look at the refiners, because they are also a stakeholder in this whole process. The refiners in, in <coughs> India are the, probably have the biggest uh, challenges. They have always had challenges, so you know it's not not something that we are unable to rise to. But the challenges for them in, through the 90s and the noughties were fuel subsidies. They had to share a burden of the fuel subsidies. You know, being national oil companies, state owned oil companies in this part of the world, as it happens to be. And then they were forever waiting. The government's share of the fuel subsidy was always delayed. So they were always waiting. Now these are, mind you, refiners were exposed to international prices. They have to buy crude on international payment terms. And they are, on the other hand, uh, selling uh, on a subsidized basis in rupees and waiting for the government to uh, sometimes three to six months delays in the government paying up its share of subsidies. What are the new challenges for Indian refiners? Um, Two-pronged. They have to keep, you know, whether EVs happens, what time, when, what, which year it happens, uh, when is the tipping point, that is something they have to keep at the back of their minds. 
But in the meantime, for the next 10 to 20 years, at the very least, they have to be ready to meet the growing demand uh, for refined products in India. And now they have to do that while being environment friendly. In this part of the world, if you look at India as an emerging nation and compare it with some of its Southeast Asian peers especially, India is leaps and bounds ahead in terms of mandating clean fuel norms. Um, some time ago, uh, so Indian uh, fuel specifications uh, countrywide are what is called Bharat Stage 4, which is equivalent to Euro 4. Uh, and the country a while ago decided to leapfrog completely, do away with the next step, which would have been Euro 5 equivalent, and go straight to Euro 6. <coughs> So that's a major challenge, challenge for uh, the refiners. Uh, the government just threw another, yet another challenge at them. I, I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures in uh, uh, the media about the smog in Delhi. Uh, it has started. It will pretty much remain through the, uh, through the winter season. It is a lot from the uh, stubble, uh, agricultural stubble being burnt, but obviously, I mean, the government is trying to do something about that, but it has drawn the government's focus to how what we can do to in, at least alleviate some of that uh, which comes as a result of vehicular pollution. So what the government has done uh, recently is advanced even further the uh, implementation of Euro 6 for Delhi. Uh, it's by two years to April 2018. So the refiners are in they are being quite uh, confident and sanguine, but uh, you know, for sure, it's, it's thrown another curveball uh, at them. Even when EVs happen, I, I agree with you uh, that the growth in oil consumption in the country is going to be uh, is foreseen to to be from come from mostly from transportation. So um, diesel is still the biggest part of the uh, barrel consumed in India, but gasoline is the fastest growing. Uh, so what happens if, in, if and when India is able to transition uh, in a big way to, to EVs? What should refiners do? They are putting in billions of dollars. They have put in billions of dollars to build state-of-the-art refineries. Now they are adding additional investment to ensure that they produce Euro 6 equivalent cleaner fuels. And if they have suddenly a shrinking gasoline market, what are they going to do? So, you know, gas oil and gasoline are the biggest share of the refined products that come out of refinery. So that is again something a little bit longer term, but that is a, a, a growing challenge uh, that the Indian refiners are, are grappling with as well. Uh, in terms of uh, climate change uh, and uh, obviously India being a signatory to uh, COP21, I think one of the most successful uh, schemes and programs that India has implemented, and it's already been mentioned this afternoon, is uh, the LPG, first of all, two-pronged. So India got rid of, India has been de-escalating the LPG subsidies uh, in the country, but simultaneously uh, it has started a program to convert poor rural households from burning biomass um, and kerosene in some cases to LPG. So that has been a hugely successful program. I like to, as again, perhaps my bias is, as a uh, an oil markets analyst, but I'd like to tie that to the removal of subsidies. Had, of course, the government was helped by the fact that uh, international prices crashed, but the removal of LPG subsidies in a way enabled what I, I don't like to use trust subsidy here, but that's effectively, effectively what is happening. Um, the asset population, the population in the cities are being asked to give up, uh, and voluntarily give up LPG subsidies. Um, a, a fair amount of popular uh, ratio of uh, households have already done that, voluntarily given up. And uh, that's not easy. Roughly 30% of the list price of LPG cylinder is subsidy. So, you know, if you, you could save a, a, a more than a few pennies by continuing to be in the subsidy scheme. 
but I think that that has been overall very very well managed, and the the money, if you will, that's been freed up uh, as a result of that, the government not having to subsidize uh, LPG, is being used to give subsidized connections, the first uh, payment of uh, the cylinder connection, first of all, and then subsequent cylinder payments are being done uh, to, to the poorer households are being given at a subsidized rate. I think that's, uh, I wanted to mention it, I think that's a very, I think a very Relatively, there have been detractors, and obviously a scheme of that scale and that grant cannot go completely without hiccups, but overall, I think the government has managed it uh, pretty well. And it has been thanks to uh, the government's policy to just do away uh, with uh, subsidies. So uh, I think that pretty much sums up the, some of the points I wanted to highlight on the uh, oil sector uh, in India with, uh, related to uh, environmental changes. Thank you, thank you very much, Adana, uh, for adding to the very rich insights that we have already gathered from the two presentations, and particularly from the oil market perspective. Uh, we have uh, a good 25 minutes before we can go into lunch, and which means time for enough questions, comments, answers. So what I'd like to request you is that please uh, introduce yourself for uh, making your interventions. On the strategic level, I think looking at it from an energy perspective, uh, South Asia is important because uh, it is a region that uh, lies between uh, the Middle East where China gets a lot of its uh, oil and gas supplies from and sort of, uh, the Straits of Malacca. So a lot of the uh, uh, shipments for oil has to pass through this region, but it's more of the maritime sector. Right? And of course, uh, there are sort of uh, articles about China being interested in building pipelines across Pakistan to bypass the Straits of Malacca. Um, I think these are issues that the Chinese will get, but from a strategic point of view, I think the immediate periphery that the Chinese are looking at is its immediate neighbors. Uh, China's relations with Russia, for example, at many levels, at the strategic security level, uh, at the energy security level, that is the most important uh, uh, sort of uh, focus for China. And of course, in Central Asia, where it's importing oil directly into China, that's also very important. So from a sort of energy access point of view, South Asia at least at this point in time, doesn't feature very highly. Um, 
except for the Indian Ocean. So I'll, I'll stop there. Does that, does that answer your question, Shivata? Does that answer your question? Uh, energy diplomacy, okay, uh, there are several aspects to it. Aspect number one is to ensure supplies of oil. Uh, India has imported uh, crude from uh, US for the first time nearly uh, 1 million, 2 million barrels of oil. I mean, this this is a breakaway, otherwise it was very heavily dependent on the Middle East, at the, gov the government refineries, and for the private refineries, Reliance, they were dependent heavily on Venezuela and, uh, and uh, South American oil. But this expansion into into uh, originating oil from the US, I think, is a, is a smart move, because uh, it is the U.S. which will play a balancing factor in the energy prices. Because their ability to switch in and switch off their new fracking wells uh, will, will ensure that for quite some time to come, this band, price band of 60 to 70 dollars will remain. I mean, we are talking of 5 to 10 years, okay, after 10 years. In the troubles in the Middle East, India is holding on to the long-term contracts of supply, which are primarily sold. Once you switch to coal, uh, the picture is different. Because coal, India's energy is encouraging private investors to go over into available coal basins and to develop uh, coal fields there with private investments. I mean, you have heard a lot about the Adani investment in Australia. There are investments in Mozambique as well. But uh, there's more to energy diplomacy than securing access to uh, uh, oil and coal. And that is where some concerns come in. For example, just to give us an example, there was a large, there was or is a very large uh, hydroelectric project in Nepal called the Guri Gandaki project, 1200 megawatt, which is awarded by the Nepal government to the Chinese on a, a no bid or ex across the table basis. Now, India's energy diplomacy has persuaded the Nepal government to relook at this and to award it in a much more transparent basis. And India's uh, NHPC is one of the bidders for this. It may get it, it may not get it. It is equally concerned about some of the projects that are getting awarded across the table in Bangladesh to Chinese uh, companies, as well as one or two projects which are getting awarded in Colombo. So I would, I would call it, uh, 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 in these countries, the energy diplomacy is to ensure providing an alternative, providing an alternative in terms of technology, in terms of uh, uh, price, and in terms of execute, project execution. A third area of energy diplomacy is really access to technology. The very decisions of going to stage 6 fuel simultaneously in, 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 in another sector encouraging development of solar panels and uh, solar systems is opening up India to foreign direct investments in these high technology sectors, which is enabling India to ramp up not only its technology, but the kind of energy efficient use that is happening inside the system. There are many other things happening, transmission, interconnection, uh, monitoring of power loss, grid power loss, 
which are all getting access international technology coming in through through easy investment accesses which is improving efficiencies here so all this is part of energy diplomacy so you see see many many different uh, initiatives happening at the same time thank you dr narayan uh, please go ahead just to add to mr narayan's comments i think the pressure uh, for india to up its game on energy diplomacy has um, subsided quite a bit Uh, if you uh, subscribe to the view that oil prices are lower for longer, which uh, you know most of the world does, yes, we've seen them rise from the mid 40s to mid 60s in recent weeks. But overall, the consensus opinion in the market is that they are not going to cross 70 anytime soon. What India needs now, in addition to diplomacy, I would argue, is market savviness. So we talked about. importing us crude for instance now one of the reasons india was a relatively late entrant to that market the chinese the japanese the koreans taiwan thailand all of these countries have been buying uh, the increasing volumes uh, of us crude that have been coming into asia at very good prices for several months india just made a start in, in september one of the reasons uh, holding india back is that for good reason <coughs> Historically, it tied up all of its crude requirements in long-term contracts, and again, most of them with the Middle Eastern producers. It has, it, it is waking up. It is raising its game now. It needs to do it a little bit faster. That has to, that that impetus has to come a little bit from the government to uh, to loosen some of the strict controls on the refiners, and it has to come from within the refiners as well. You know, they need to make a representation to the government as well that you need us to be competitive. Uh, and uh, you know, and at the same time, you're you're tying our our arms. So you know, just allow us to buy more of our crude on a spot market basis. So you cannot, U.S. crude is all being bought on a spot basis, not on like annual contracts. So India, so, so I would argue that in addition to diplomacy, which is now probably not such a <coughs> pressing need, uh, because it is a buyer's market, it is going to remain a buyer's market. That. The, the the month that India debuted in U.S. crude imports, uh, an entire delegation from OPEC was in India. That same, you know, it's not a coincidence. Obviously, they are feeling the heat. The same month, Aramco, which has been supplying crude to India for how many decades, <coughs> for the first time decided to open an office in India. Why do you think they did that, right? So. Everybody is lining up at India's doors. They were lining up outside China's doors, and it still remains important and a bigger consumer than India. But India is the bigger growth consumer uh, right now. So, then, so I think in, when it comes to how you know unshackling the refiners, allowing them to hedge production, that's also an important part. The Indian government is still keeping very tight reins uh, on that. So it needs to become a savvy buyer. You know, this is this is the time. It's a it's buyer's market. It's time for India to uh, liberalize, if you will, a little bit. Thank you, uh, Kartik. I think uh, just in the interest of time, it might be good to collect a few questions for the speakers. So please go ahead, and if there are, yeah, it's so two, and I think is there a third hand anywhere? Okay, a third is visible. So let's take three questions, and then we will come back to the speakers. Kathi, go ahead. You can take mine. In the discussion, in, in both Dr. Narayan's presentation and Ravana's uh, comments, I just felt that we were being uh, too there was too much focus on the cyclic nature of. The price change, as opposed to a discussion on transition itself. Right? I mean, we were talking about you know tactical moves to do X, Y, and Z. I understand that yes, for some reasonable time in the next, let's say, 10 years or whatever, prices might lie in the 70s. But I didn't quite see the discussion popping up. Uh, elements of what exactly is the transition story? In there. Transition, of course, is slightly longer term, right? And uh, to me, there. There are two concerns in that. One is, uh, given that it's 
uh, government holds significant stake in the performance of these oil companies, both upstream, you know, midstream, downstream in India. Uh, will they let go easily of you know the revenue stream that accrues to them? Because you know India is basically hooked on tax dollars from uh, the oil industry, right? Effectively, non-compliance of direct taxes that the government should be collecting is being you know is being seen from you know, increased mopping up of revenues from indirect taxes through basically uh, consumption taxes like from oil. So, will they actually let EVs come on in a big way? Because effectively, they know that they are not a player today in the EV space. Right? They are very unlikely to be as well because it requires a different mentality to be able to get into that because of the complexity and the different nature of the game itself. So, what role does the fact that the predominant supplier of, uh, you know, of oil and Things that move the transport industry, being the government, have to move on EVs. And on just the follow-up question, I'm sorry about the prolonged one. On EVs, then, is that's the sort of like a uh, the counter story is that if you look at the EV story across the world, right, if you look at the cumulative demand that is being projected in terms of gigawatt hours of storage capacity required versus the cumulative installed capacity for producing uh, batteries. There's a huge mismatch. I'm not talking about what is today, I'm talking about what, let's say, the IEA is saying in 2030, right? If the demand is about of the order of 1,300, the production capacity is only going to be about 400. So, who is going to bridge that gap and whose aspirations are going to take a hit, right? Every country wants to sort of go, you know, all feed EV or whatever by 2030, but clearly that can't happen because there are constraints on production. And then, resource nationalism, right? If today, if oil is basically what is constituting the resource nationalism story, then you know, it's lithium and cobalt, right? Which, let's say, China has significantly gone in with early stakes on in Australia and Chile and in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Ghana resources. India has been very, very slow to move on that. India has got zero traction on that. So if you're talking about diplomacy and energy, India has got zero. None of it. Basically, they have, they have no sense of where that game is going. They've let China run away literally with the uh, overall, uh, you know, production of lithium batteries. So, I'm not sure of you know how both of these play out. Right? Like you can't actually no one incentivize EVs at the same time. We can't actually have EVs proliferated in the big way. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's only Khan Murai from WWF. Uh, I want to ask essentially Dr. Narayan. Uh, you mentioned about the India taking kind of lead on the uh, international negotiation on the climate change, uh, which, which I see. And if you look at the Paris Agreement, the whole the liquidity debate, uh, the whole liquidity angle came uh, and great goes to the Indian negotiator. But my question is particularly in terms of whether the India is ready to review the uh, their existing the INDCs or intended national entitlement contribution that they had put forward before the Paris Agreement. Because as we all know, uh, the Paris Agreement talks about uh, stabilizing the global emissions under temperature to 1.5, and the, all the INDCs are heading to 2.7. Uh, so, uh, pocket range emission of India is relatively low, but if you look, the absolute emission is quite high. So, in that context, uh, do you foresee whether India will be ready to review its I, uh, NDCs or review the INDCs and put forward the new target? On the on the uh, existing, uh, I would say the NDCs before the Paris Agreement kicks into force in 2021. Thank you. Uh, the third question, sir. Hello, my name is Yagesh, and uh, sorry, it's slightly long, but I had one thought or point to ponder and a couple of questions. The point to ponder first, probably take more from what Ms. Hari was talking about. We've been fairly misled at times by whatever per capita indicates. For example, I mean, in this particular case, if you're going with per capita consumption of energy, oil, or electricity, as the case might be, the extent of factors that are influencing the energy descent. Uh, a household would bother more about the monthly bill they are paying for transportation and petrol than anything else. In industry, productivity improvements that can actually lower consumption of oil or coal might vary the per capita consumption in terms of volume very drastically. But when we are making policy based on or policy observations and recommendations based on per capita figures that get thrown out by agencies, you might
my data view is here. This is my information. Uh, I'll just throw it open as a point to ponder. Uh, on, on the couple of questions that I had, and thanks for, uh, thanks for some truly insightful, incisive, and, and objective assessments, uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Nahan. But the first question, since the morning we have been discussing what policies, what the governments could do, what the regulations could use, out, etc. Are there or could there be workable and working models for the private sector and multilateral agencies to sidestep and completely work around this morass and inaction? For example, can there be private sector and multilateral funded or subsidized asset ownership that cuts across several countries, several borders, or several locations that could be decentralized power centers, for example, uh, within a country too? And can that be cutting across borders too? Uh, is that worth a debate? Uh, the second question probably directed a bit more at Dr. Narayan, given uh, the fantastic observations that Dr. Chen made about the trilemma and the, and the SDGs, and how you could look at consumption dictating to the patterns of where the power are or where the energy is actually being spent by way of usage. Uh, do you think India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan have mastered or have scored well on how they handle the trilemma? By the trilemma, I would mean security, uh, the access, and the sustainability. Or are they conveniently winging it in terms of what is the need of the hour politically dictated? Now, uh, an attached question there, and I'm aware India is able to. Maybe, maybe the money. attachment can wait for lunch. I'm <laughs> so sorry. Okay. Because we are already just five minutes short of the uh, lot of time, and uh, I think what I would request is. Uh, Chris, Dr. Narayan, and Vandana in that order to take two to two and a half minutes each to respond to the questions that have come. Thank you. Chris. I think there was just uh, one question for me. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you are asking whether the companies or the uh, industry can sidestep the government in trying to implement uh, its uh, business. Is that, is that what you mean? Um, I, I think uh, it would be very difficult uh, simply because when a company enters a country, it will have to abide by the regula regulations and it will have to work very closely with the government. And uh, this is something you cannot run away from. You can't work uh, as a sort of private, separate entity without any kind of uh, coordination with, with the government. I don't see that happening. Thank you. Dr. Nuren, you have uh, more than one uh, I have tough very, issues very, to handle. No, no, very, very, very quickly. Uh, the transition question, whether you, you, you can go for, I mean, I mean uh, we are looking at cyclical issues rather than transition issues. <coughs> what is transition? We are moving, we, are, we have already moved in the last two, three years from uh, a, a high cost energy to a lower cost energy. Okay, that's a transition. We are moving from uh, energy, uh, much more energy efficient solutions, which is you take it as LEDs or better transmission, better energy exchanges. One of the biggest transitions that has happened is the better energy exchanges. So I think these are all, all, all kind of uh, uh, together. It's all together. And if you really say 10, 15 years later, who knows? If there is a is the cracking of the storage, then power cost may become zero. So if you listen to one of the TED talks, it says that in 15 years, power will cost zero. There will be no cost for electricity at all. Okay. Who knows? Uh, climate change, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know because I'm not part of the either the negotiations or the commitments that India is making. Whether it is going to, it is in a, whether it has promised that it will review the Contribution or are they to this thing? I, I, I kind of have to say I should not talk about things which I really don't don't uh, know about. Per capita indicators, I would submit that that is the only thing that development is all about per capita, and it is a combination of household consumption, it's a combination of industrial consumption, combination of goods, of livelihood concerns, everything. So. Unless we are able to improve our capital consumption, it's a proxy for finally, uh, finally development indicators. So that becomes the most important uh, 
issue private sector models. You have a very, very good asset ownership model which China is, is propagating through his OBOR row policy. Who is owning all the assets? It's linking up all the power stations uh, from, I would say, China right up to Central Asia. So there is a model that is emerging there. And, uh, uh, okay, is it a relevant model? Will it work? We'll have to wait and see. And finally, the, the, the uh, dilemma of security, access, and accountability. I think all the policies, all the things that are happening, not just in India, very surprisingly, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India are all following similar ideas in reaching towards, uh, um, okay, they are going different paths, the paths follow different, the concepts are, are, are the same, for providing security, access as well as sustainability to their individual consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moran. last words from you. It's a real privilege. Thank you. What is the transition story in, in India? I think it's between aspirational leapfrogging and more practical incremental changes. And I think I'm a fan of the second because from for as long as I've seen India, nothing happens quickly. And it's not necessarily bad thing, but I, there's two imperatives, energy access for the energy poor, and the, a relatively new imperative is uh, being environmentally friendly development, right? So the government will necessarily be slow. I think all reform, reforms will be slow because those imperatives don't always pull in the same direction. Personally, if I were to give my opinion to the government, which nobody has asked me for, but uh, I would say, and I would argue energy access, removing energy poverty is more important because that's the foremost, if you don't have economic development, you can sing all the praises and, and you know, say we are environmentally friendly. Yes, that's important, but you need to have energy access for the, for the poor, you know. Uh, so so it's, it's those two happening. When it comes to aspirational leapfrogging, I would say the EV target that Mr. Modi just put out there, that's the aspirational leapfrogging. You're absolutely right. Where will the, the power come from at, at a uh, reasonable rate of uh, supply? Uh, where will the infrastructure come from? I think infrastructure development has always been slow in the country, so there's a lot of questions around that. An even bigger question is all those revenues that the government is currently getting from petrol, diesel, and, and LPG sales, right? How is the government going to find, how is it going to replace that? Uh, can it tax uh, cars? Of course not. If China has has boosted car EVs by actually reducing, subsidizing the cars. So India hardly has the option of raising taxes. So that's going to be absolutely, I don't think anybody has a simple solution, but where does the tax revenue come from that's lost? And it's going to be a big one. A quick one on per capita. So it's only, it's one metric. It gives you a big picture story that yes, it's Per capita, if it's low, it is likely that it's going to uh, lead to a rising consumption. But it's never the full metric, right? never the full story. Uh, in fact, the argument now is that the real development, not just for India, but all emerging countries, will be to reach that level of, um, of uh, development uh, for their people without necessarily climbing the same curve, curve of per capita. Agree. Uh, but on a, on a, so when we, we talk about per capita, it's on a very broad scale. You know, uh, directionally, is India going up in its energy demand, or, or plateauing, or going down? And, the, and we use that metric to say that chances are it's going up because of per capita. But yes, you're right. There's a lot about the factors that come into Thank you, Vandana, and uh, thank you so much, all the speakers, discussant, and commentators for sticking to time. And please join me in giving a big hand. So we have concluded the second session of the workshop. Let me now hand over to the MC for the day. For the Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Len and Dr. Palitas, two chairman of the previous sessions, to show our appreciation to the guest speakers and the guest discussant and present them with a small tokens of appreciation. Uh, so, Mr. Karthi Ganesan, Ms. Lydia Powell, and Ms. Vandana Hari. Thank you.